Welcome to another video. My name is Raphael Freeman from Running Our Typesetting. And today's video, we're going to be talking about character styles in Microsoft Word. Now, we're going to be using the PC version of Microsoft Word. Um, the version of the Macintosh has improved drastically, but some of the features that we're going to show here are not available on the Mac, which is a shame. Um, so maybe another 10, 20 years, Microsoft might add them. In the meanwhile, um, if you're using a Mac, you might want to install a copy of Parallels um, or Boot Camp so you can run the Windows version of Microsoft Word. So let's get straight in character styles. What are they useful for? Well, if you've watched my video on paragraph styles, you'll see that actually styles can be very useful in order to get your document ready. Now, what does it mean to get it ready? So the emphasis on this video is for authors, editors, proofreaders, um, who are preparing texts for the next stage, which is typesetting. Um, it's also very useful if you're preparing your documents for uh, digital formats. Uh, but uh, And even if you just want to be able to format your documents much more efficiently, then character styles are going to be very useful. Now, character styles are going to provide two different things. The first thing they're going to do is ensure a consistency across the document and allow you to change something rapidly by having character styles. But the really important reasons why we want to use character styles is in order to communicate to the next person in the chain, and here I'm coming from the point of view of the typesetter, exactly what you want in a particular place, and that that information is not lost. Let's now take a look. I'm going to open up a copy of Word, and I'm actually going to create a new, a new file here, that other file we're going to play with in a moment. Um, I'm going to now hide myself, because you've seen enough of me. Um, and let's now look uh, look at Word, okay? So if I type some random text, here I'm typing random text, here you go, um, and we make this text uh, nice and big, um, and we say a random text, I'm typing on the computer. Uh, of course I can't type. Um, and I want to make a word I type. Okay, so how would we normally do that? Well, we just take the word computer, and there are a number of ways. We can click the little I button on the top right. We can also see that it says Control I. So we could just do Control I, or we could highlight it and choose the I here. And now we've made this word italic. Um, I want to make this word bold. Control B doesn't work, of course, because I've assigned it to a macro. <laughs> Control B, and I've made it bold. So What's wrong with this? Now, when I take this text and I make it bold, or this text and I make it italic, the term that we use for this is local formatting. We've changed the formatting in a very specific place. Okay, This is great, but it does have some disadvantages. Um, let's now have a look, though, what's happening underneath. So it's a very important shortcut, but if you if you click over here, you see there's the styles. I um, mean, just actually I'm hovering my mouse over, and you can see the shortcut is Alt Control Shift S, okay, which is what I normally click. And we see now all the styles that are being used in this document. I'm going to make it a little bit easier for for me to work with this. I'm going to put this into uh, uh, no, I don't want that over there. I do apologize. I want to have this over here and this over here. So now. We, this paragraph style is the built-in word style called normal. Well, since I've assumed we've all learned how to make paragraph styles, I'm going to make a new paragraph style called body, because we can. And we're going to choose a typeface. Let's choose one of the ones that I like. OK, so now we have something a little bit more, a little bit more formatted, a little bit more nicely. OK, and what we have is, click on the word t uh, random, and we see it's got the style body. If you look very carefully, you'll see there's a little symbol here next to the word body. I have to move the mouse out of the way. It's called a pilcrow. There you go. You've learned a new word, a pilcrow. It's an inverse paragraph mark, and that tells you that this is a paragraph style. Okay? The paragraph style called body. So just as a quick recap, if I want to change that style, I can highlight it, and I can make the full justified. Um, of course, I did that completely incorrectly. I do apologize. 
I can make it a full justified paragraph. Here you go. It's rather poorly spread out, but it doesn't matter. Uh, random text, okay, computer. But what about this word text? If I take this panel, this styles panel, and I go down to options down here, I've got some options here, and I'm going to change this. I'm going to change this to in use, change it to alphabetical. I'm going to choose the word font formatting. I'm going to leave the rest unclicked. And the moment I do that, I can see that it's got bold. Now there's a little aleph here, it's a Hebrew first character. Um, if you don't use not using a Hebrew system, it probably won't have it, it won't have an aleph there. Okay, that's just for because I've got a Hebrew system. And this tells me this style is italic. And this is called local formatting. Now the reason why we care about this being local is that it's very easy for this to get lost. Now, I'm going to give you an example of how this can get lost. Let me take this very large paragraph and I'm going to get rid of all the formatting, but I just hit control space. And I'm going to now highlight this and I'm going to highlight a few words and make them italic. There we go. And we've now made. Okay, now. If I go ahead and apply the style body, notice we lost all the italics. If I do the same thing to this style, I won't lose it, but I lost it here. And the reason why was because the majority of this paragraph was in italics. Now, it's not normal to have the majority of a normal sized paragraph to be in italics. It can happen though, but if you have a title, the title could have three words in it, and two of those words could be in italic. And then when you apply that style, those two words in italic are now lost. And if you were the editor that put all those foreign words into italic, you won't be very happy. So that's just one reason why not. Okay, so it's probably better not to. So how do we now then go ahead and create a character style? Well, it's exactly like creating a paragraph style. So we go, well, we're in the styles panel now, and at the bottom are these three little buttons, and we choose, it's very small because it's a, it's a large screen, so I do apologize. We choose the first button, which has new style, and we call this, let's just call it cool. Okay, let's use a more, uh, more sensible uh, style. Let's call it IT text, okay, for italic text. And when we choose the next thing, the style type, we're going to choose character. Now, what I like to do is I like to make the color of the font red when it's using italics. And there's a reason for this. And we're going to see this later if I remember. I hope I do. Okay, so now we have IT text. Of course, what I forgot to do is to actually apply the italic style to this style, which is a bit silly of me. What I can also go ahead and do is I can, I've already done this before, but I'll do it again just to show you. I can do the shortcut key and it's already been applied as F7. Okay, I don't know why I've chosen F7 for, for italics, but I have. So that means if I want to make the word and italics, I just hit the F7 key. And notice it's made it red italic. I could go now back to my IT text character style and I can say, ha, huh, this is interesting. Well, actually, let's have a bit more fun with this. Now, why you'd have, what may have more fun with it could be in a variety of reasons. It might be good reasons, but it might also be useful for you to find something in terms of your editorial process. Or you might just want to have a bit of fun. So we could just make some blue underlines. OK, there you go. So now all the italic text is red with blue underlines. So that's how you make an italic character style. And again, I do advise you to apply a shortcut key. We can now take this word computer, but we don't actually have to find, obviously we can see the word computer right now, but we don't actually have to look for it because we can see it here. And we can right click and find all the instances of text with italic in it and just hit either click on the IT text or we can just hit F7. So now let's take a real document and see how we would actually apply this.
Um, now I have to find the document, which I had prepared earlier. Here we go. So here's the document. And I'm just going to do a save as and call it video. So we don't accidentally do anything real with here. And uh, I'm going to make this text very large as I'm using a large screen here. So I want it to, you to be able to read it if you're looking at this on a small screen. And as you can see, lots and lots of text. So now let's now bring up this styles panel. Remember, it was Control Alt Shift S, or you can press on the little button up here. But I tend to find using shortcut keys easier. Go into Options, Show Font Formatting. Only show me the the styles in use. Show them for me alphabetically. And now what I can see is I can actually very quickly see all sorts of things. So, for example, I can go ahead and find stuff in italics. I've just found now 64, I'm going to actually zoom out now, 64 um, instances where text is in italics in the bibliography. So I'm going to now go ahead and create a new style. And I always use IT text because I can do it more quickly. And I like doing things in red. And I can go ahead now. And this, this document had its uh, font formatting all on. So I do apologize for that. Original. OK. Um, and now I've now highlighted and found all the text in italics. Well, not all of it, but most of it. Now, this feature doesn't, to the best of my knowledge, and if anyone tells me I'm wrong, please put it in the comments and I'll be thrilled. Um, but I couldn't find this feature on the Mac. This is the feature I was talking about. So I can now highlight all the italics, find all the italics in the text, okay, by just simply looking through and seeing where I've got a style that has italics added, okay? And I can apply my italic character style. But I can also use this technique to find weird things. For example, this very difficult, and I do know a proofreader that is able to distinguish a 11 point period instead of a 12 point period, but most of us aren't that good. Um, I'd have been hard pressed to find that semicolon being an aerial, but as of this document Times New Roman, it's different between here and here. But by using this technique, we can find things that shouldn't be there. Now, there we can just do control space. Control space, again, to remind you, gets rid of, well, actually, in Word, all formatting. OK, so I can now go ahead. Now, why was that dash in italic? That was a mistake. So we'll get rid of that. OK, and we can go and get rid of the black here. But again, we're trying to find things in italics to put into the character style IT text. So here. We've got the word only, and there are indeed another 35 of these instances, OK? So I can go ahead and do that. And by doing that, I can find all the italic text in my document, and I can go ahead and um, apply the character styles very quickly. Now, what's happened here, these, are, these should not be in italics. And here I'm going to get rid of it. OK, this should not be. I'm just going to do a control space. I apologise, my phone is ringing. Um, <laughs> it's going to now transfer to my cell phone afterwards. Never mind. And here we've got some blue text. And we can go ahead and we can clean up the document um, very quickly, OK, uh, by using this technique. OK, so I talked about italics. The same, uh, the same system can be used to find bolds. And any other superfluous, um, not this, not this says superfluous, we could find any other different um, uh, stuff that's on the thing. For example, we've got some small caps here. Why is this space small caps? I don't know. But, and this is actually very important. Here we've got these numbers, um, which these are these are verse numbers, and the the author and the editor wanted to make them different. But how do we know which is which? So here what we can do is we can now create a, 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 a character style. We'll call it verse number, VN. I'm just lazy. And we can give it a nice color green. OK. And now we can highlight the number five. 
And you see what's happened here is that the, the editor started, she told me this in advance, she started to highlight each number one by one and she called it verse number. Um, and then she said, that's too much, can do, can do the rest. It's like taking too long. So she only did up to here. So now I just highlight the number 19 and now I can get the other 121 verse numbers, which look all the same as this one. And I could highlight this one, another 150 of these. So I have to do a few selections, but I've now selected several hundred of these verse numbers um, and in one click, I've now applied a character style. So when I bring this into typesetting, and this book actually already has been typeset, so maybe we'll have a look at it afterwards, you can see what it looks like. Now, why it's particularly useful to apply colors is that, and we don't have a situation like this here because the, the editor on this particular book is uh, uh, particularly good. Um, but for example, this quote here, this quote mark here is correctly in Roman. But if it had been put into italics, it'd be very easy and quick to see, oh, this shouldn't be in italics because we would see it's in bright red. Um, so by putting things in italics, you can see if uh, punctuation, etc., is not in the right place. Um, here they've used a, 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 a character style and you can see the little A. Remember I mentioned the pilcro for the paragraph styles. Um, but what you have here now for um, um, the, the, the character styles were created here and we can modify this character style because this character style is good. We want to keep that one. So I'm going to make it blue so I know that I want to keep that. Now what's actually going to happen with this character style is it's called head running. And when I typeset this I'm actually going to put this into, actually put it into the past tense, it's already been done. Um, I made this the same typeface as this and I made it small caps and of course I took away the bright blue. Um, but here the, the editor has communicated to me that they want this to be typeset differently from this. So this is a very, very useful technique um, and it enables you to quickly apply uh, uh, character formatting. Um, and find it. But there is a caveat. And the caveat is, um, is that it doesn't work in footnotes. So this wonderful styles panel, which shows all the local formatting throughout the text. Here we've got another verse number that we need to, uh, we need to uh, find. Okay. It's only one of them typical. Um, doesn't work within um, within the footnotes. So how do we find text in the footnotes? It's rather irritating because of course many books do have footnotes. Now this book I think actually has endnotes. Um, I have to actually have a look. Uh, but either way it still didn't find it. I highlight this italic text and it doesn't display here. And for many many years uh, the way that I would solve this would be doing lots of search and replaces. And search and replaces are often a good way of doing it, but there's, there's perhaps another way which might be better. Uh, if you hit Shift F1, it brings up another panel called Reveal Formatting. Now, it took me a couple of times to work this out. I'm not really interested in what it says down here. If I move the mouse over next to Acadian and I click on this arrow, you can say Select All Text with Similar Formatting. And it won't be perfect because as you can see it got this, 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 but it didn't get the NCB, but we'll get back to NCB. It does get a lot, look at that. So I hit F7 um, and that's already done a lot of my work for me. Now it's not perfect, as I said, it hasn't got everything. I have to go back in again um, and I can go ahead and see more and I can see this word OTG and I can click again on select all text with similar formatting. So it works in a similar way to the styles on the right, but it doesn't tell you how many you caught each time. And again, the most important, the most useful feature of the styles on the right is that you can see, you can get to a point where this is completely clean, which is what I would do when I'm cleaning up the document. Now your job as the editor isn't to clear up the document, your job as the editor is to make sure you can communicate all what you need. It's the typesetter's job to make sure the footnote references doesn't have black applied on top of that, why ever that happens, I don't know. But you can, so, so this way you can use it, I'm going to find another one over here and I'm going to do select 
all text with similar formatting, F7. And I think I just got one thing there. So that way you can go through an entire document, you can have a look out for things that have been now put into italics, again, particularly punctuation, which shouldn't be, um, and you can fix that, um, and then you can have a very clean document. Now, there is another area where um, something that can be very, very useful, and people don't think about it too much, um, but it's actually can save a lot of time in this, um, when you get to proofreading after a book has been typeset, and that is hyphenation. Um, now, there's, they're going to show you two things here. Uh, the first thing is Hebrew. Now, there's no Hebrew in this particular document. I mean, that there is after the typesetting, but there isn't just yet. But often you get a book where there's a lot of Hebrew characters in the book, right? And what you can do is, is you can do a search. You can do a find. I actually do, I do control H and then clicking on the find and going to more and going into format and you can do language. Now those of you who are thinking, I don't know any Hebrew, I don't care, but you're going to see why this can be very useful. So I can find any text that has, that's in Hebrew. Now that's obviously wrong, it's a space. But this can be an excellent method of finding Hebrew text uh, within a document and then applying a character style for Hebrew or Hebrew italic or Hebrew bold. Great. But you can also use it, and this is one of the great things about Word. How does it know it's Hebrew? Because it's recognizing the characters that's a Hebrew word. But what you can also do is you might have French words in your document. So we can now go and get into language and see if there's any French. As an editor, you will know this if you've got French words in your book. Now, there shouldn't really be any words in French. It's not a French book. But if you've got a book with lots of French words in it or German words in it, by highlighting them and applying a character style. Now, this would re require having a French Roman and a French Italic character style, but then this will allow the typesetter to apply French hyphenation rules to the text that has been formatted with a French character style. Again, you probably have to have one, two, perhaps three, four of these styles within character styles within your book for Roman, Italic, and potentially bold and bold italic. Um, so this is something to think about. But if you're dealing with a book that has multiple languages in, um, the, the, the ability to search for a language, Word does a pretty good job. It's not perfect, and you'll have to check it and color it to make sure that indeed that is French or the appropriate language. Um, but this is a very, very neat trick. So I think I've caught everything. I'm sure I've missed out a few things. Um, I would just like one small point that I want to mention, and that's to do with small caps. Um, let's say you wanted to put Michigan into small caps. Um, again, remember that your job is you're communicating to the typesetter that this word is to be in small caps. If I now highlight this text, Michigan or UK or SCM, um, there are more obvious ones like uh, BCE, etc., um, or even something as simple as um, here, where you go, CE. If I take this and I now apply, uh, I, uh, I'll just do local formatting, small caps, it doesn't look like anything happened. It's still big. And the reason for this is because in Microsoft Word, the only way you're making it small caps is if you type it SCE in small characters. Well, you don't have to do that. All you have to do is to the typesetter is say, listen, I want this word to be small caps. So I can create a new character style. I can call it SC. And I always make small caps in pink. I've got no idea why. It must have been a reason uh, that I did this many years ago. And then I, as a typesetter, know that this should be in small caps. You don't have to worry about capital lowercase because when I bring this into Adobe InDesign with the fonts that I'm using, uh, I can do that. So you can decide to do part one, part two in small caps. Or you can tell the, f the typesetter, um, you can give an instruction, anything that starts with part I, please put it into small caps. And part three can be in small caps, and this part one can be in small caps. And then the typesetter can do what we call a grep search to, to find those uh, particular um, small cap characters. So there you go, I just added a few more italics. And another small point as well, um, one of the things that 
um, editors often worry about is if you look over here, we're going to see there's a problem that this L is almost touching this closed parenthesis. Don't try and fix it. Don't put in an extra thin space or something like that. Let the typesetter fix that using kerning um, because remember it's going to be a different typeface and it will cause all sorts of problems. So that is the job of the typesetter to make sure you don't have an italic L colliding with a closed parenthesis. Okay, I'm sure, I hope you've enjoyed this, this, this little tutorial. I hope it hasn't been too long and you've understood some of what I've had to say. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to put it in the comments. Every time you put something in the comments, I get notified immediately. Um, and I will try and respond. And you're very welcome to respond to me privately. Um, my website is www.runnertype.com and uh, you will find there other videos and you can find me on Google and probably on Facebook and even on Twitter um, under various different handles which you'll have to Google for. Um, thank you very much, thank you for listening.